Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, Principal Atmospheric Scientist at Nutrient Ag Solutions, and I want to thank you for watching this weekly Ag Weather Update brought to you by the Farm Credit Associations of North Carolina. Well, what I'd like to provide at the beginning of this video is some perspective, some perspective on how the summer has been going, what we're dealing with in terms of temperatures, and also with drought and precipitation. So let's begin first by looking at statewide average temperature ranks on the left-hand side of your screen here, looking at July 2019. There's a number in each state, the number inside of North Carolina there is 115. That means that the July temperature records give this uh, put this basically as ranking as 115 out of 125 so very warm July across much of the eastern part of North America here but putting this in a more broad perspective take a look at the map over there on the right statewide average temperature ranks from February through July so basically the last six months we can see that we're currently rank 123rd out of 125th and this has been the name of the game and why I'm bringing this up to start is we're gonna be talking at the end of this video about the long-range forecast for the rest of October October, excuse me, the rest of August, but through September and October, and you're going to see that this warmer pattern is forecast to continue. Now, talking about precipitation, let's take a look at the most recent drought monitor. This was released last Thursday. We are still dealing with the patchy drought in parts of coastal Carolinas, both of them, and then also right here on the North Carolina-South Carolina border. Outside of the Carolinas, across parts of the Cotton Belt, some pockets of drought, this particular region in Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, western parts of Kansas. Kansas and Oklahoma has been showing up drier and drier with each week, and that's primarily been due to this big upper level ridge that's sitting just to their west. And also, a critical area to be watching right now if you're a corn and soybean farmer in the Carolinas is what's going on in Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana, because that particular region has seen some patchy drought showing up here, and some locations have gone uh, with very little rain over the last 45 days or so. But some recent rainfall in that area is going to change some things, and that will impact North and South Carolina agriculture. So, to give you some perspective on this though, let me take off my drawings and show you where we were a year ago. So this is the most recent drop monitor and this is what things look like a year ago. Now it's interesting to see those differences there. A lot more drought in the Southern Plains getting up into Missouri, but look over there on the East Coast. Now remember, this was before Florence. Okay, so this was before Florence came in and dumped all of that rain. So just interesting to see the differences between now and a year ago. Maybe another way to look at this is by taking a look at this new map I'm going to show you here called the Quick Drought Response Index. This is put out by uh, NOAA, the University of Nebraska. This is a near-term, a short-term drought monitor feature to look at. And we can see places that have been very wet and places that have been very dry. And you can see that there is still across much of the southeast and through here some pockets of drier conditions where we've seen some high evapotranspiration rates during our days when we haven't had much precipitation. And that's really prevented us from getting way far ahead overall on our precipitation so far throughout the year. Flash drought index still showing up right here in the part of the Corn Belt and down here in the south, uh, south central part of the United States as well. With, and the reason why we see wetter than average conditions in through here is primarily due to Barry much earlier this year and then the north central plains very wet as well. So keep an eye on those regions outside of the Carolinas as they are important for uh, competition reasons. Okay, Maybe to show it one other way, this is the last 30 days in terms of percent of normal precipitation. And what I want to do with this is, yes, you can can see that the pockets in there that are getting over to those red colors indicating drier conditions. But what I want to do is I want to show you where we've had over the last 30 days, six inches or more of rainfall. So take a look at this. Yep, there are some pockets in North Carolina that have gotten some very, very heavy rainfalls in the last couple of weeks here. Uh, and as a result, there are some places that are a major surplus of rainfall. This is the hit or miss nature of our thunderstorms. But now watch this. I'm only going to show you regions now that have had less than three inches over the last 30 days. Are you ready? That's what it looks like. So what I'm trying to show you here is we have pockets of North Carolina that have seen flooding rains recently and then places that are well below average here, below three inches in the last 30 days. That's very atypical uh, for parts of North Carolina at this time of year. Do notice how dry it's been in the Southern Plains and in the heart of the Corn Belt here, just for some additional perspective. Okay, some locations did get hammered recently. I gotta show you this picture. Yeah, this is from last week, and I hope you saw this on the news or saw this from some of your friends or on social media. But this is a classic example of what we call a microburst. So in Charlotte, when you look here, this is the downdraft. This is the precipitation loaded, dense pocket of air that descends from the storm. It's often very cool in here, but I drew that arrow because as this particular downdraft hit 
the ground, it spread out horizontally, producing what we call a microburst. This is a very localized, strong downdraft here coming into the airport in Charlotte. Just a beautiful picture here posted by Tim Buckley, uh, but uh, originally taken by Jim Wood. I just want to thank those guys for getting this great picture out for us. That has been the nature of the beast for North Carolina summer so far, right? Some locations getting some heavy rain while other locations have not. Over the weekend, much of North Carolina spent it uh, relatively dry. Just some showers and storms right here along the coast and back here in the Appalachian Mountains. Meanwhile, much of the activity was in the Pacific Northwest, running around a ring just like this here, keeping things very high and dry in Texas, but lighting up the central plains. Well, the question is, where is the rain going in the near term? And to answer that question, we got to step up in the upper levels of the atmosphere. Dominating the lower Mississippi River Valley and the South Central Plains is this large ridge sitting right in through here. But you in North Carolina, I want you to watch this shortwave here this shortwave here as they progress through the Corn Belt and into the Great Lakes states, because that will be middle of our week, our best chances at bringing in more storms. Meanwhile, also pay attention to this trough sitting right in through here, because with time, that is going to progress east and broaden out into a larger trough that's going to be over the western U.S. Translation, heat builds back into the southeast. You're going to see that in a few moments here. So starting you off in the day on, um, on Monday here, yes, the, both Carolina is kind of free of our major hazards, but the heat that we do see building into this area will be spreading east with time. So we will be seeing some much above average temperatures, uh, at least to start off the week, but I'll show you how that calms down in a few moments. And by the way, in that deeper trough that is out west, look at the frost advisories for parts of Nevada. So this is a very active pattern that's setting up, an important one to pay attention to as we progress through this week. So what are we seeing? Well, throughout much of the day here on Monday for the Carolinas, relatively dry, and this even translates over into Tuesday. But this system that's moving right now through parts of Nebraska, Illinois, Iowa, and over in Indiana will translate east with time. And we're going to be watching on Tuesday night into Wednesday morning for this main frontal boundary to kind of slide south here into the Carolinas, giving us our next chance at some decent precipitation. So the main severe weather threat today, well, let me show it to you here. It's tucked away in parts of the Corn Belt. As we get into the day on Tuesday, that's the map that's over here on the right, watch that boundary sneaking in through here such that into Tuesday night and Wednesday morning, we will be bringing our best chance at showers and storms this week into North Carolina. But the first couple of days of the week stays away from where we are. Let's watch our high resolution NAM model to pick up on where this precipitation is coming for us in the next couple of days. Now this takes you all the way out to uh, 8 a.m. on Wednesday. And let me step you back here and show you some important rains. Early morning rainfall on Monday, moving through Nebraska into Iowa, eventually over into southern Wisconsin, see it here, Illinois and Indiana. Now you need to know that because that is going to affect our corn and soybean markets quite a bit, given how dry things were right in this corridor. But you can see outside of some hit or miss showers and storms on the mountains, not a very active day for the Carolinas here on Monday, getting into Tuesday morning. Now that main squall line moves through parts of the Mid-South over toward the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast by the time we get into afternoon on Tuesday. And it'll be Tuesday evening that we're going to start to watch that storm fire up on that boundary again, right in through this area. In the overnight hours on Tuesday, getting into Wednesday morning, this is the chance for our best chance, I should say, for some storms midweek. You can see them pushing through the Carolinas here, possibly Tuesday overnight into Wednesday morning. Okay. Beyond that, let's just take a look here at what we're seeing over the next 60 hours from three separate models. You can see that uh, while we're bringing quite a bit of rainfall, all three of these models into parts of the Corn Belt, we do see that both in the operational NAM model and in the European model down here in the bottom, keeping us dry through early morning on Wednesday, with just the GFS bringing the best chances of precip through by, again, late Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. Now, beyond that, watch this. This is the critical piece we're going to be paying attention to. This is the shortwave that overnight Tuesday into Wednesday morning will be progressing over toward the Northeast. See it right there. There we go. That will give us our decent chance for showers and storms midweek. But watch how this pattern evolves beyond this. By Thursday night, stagnating pattern in the Pacific. See the high over low here. And what that's going to allow to have happen is this deeper trough sweeps into the northern part of the U.S. and the western part of the U.S. And right there for our weekend, this is how things set up through the middle of the month. Now you can see the ridge that's sitting here over the southeast. And yes, that brings in uh, the heat. 
But at the same time, I want you to know that in the low levels, higher atmospheric pressure is going to keep this kind of continual feed of moisture. And as a result of that, even though our pattern moves into this ridge, moisture sneaks in underneath this. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Over the next 10 days, this is the European model on the left and the GFS on the right. You can see along the Gulf Coast, very heavy rain. You can see that in parts of the eastern half of North Carolina, at least picking up an additional inch of rain. And that is reflected in both the ECMWF and in the European model. Now, the broader corridor of heavy rainfall is stretching in through this area. Again, it's just kind of moving around that broader area of higher atmospheric pressure. This is not from tropical cyclones. We don't have it in the forecast in the next 10 days. But to show you some model agreement here, this is the last four runs put together by the GFS model. And I've, what I've done is I've color coded in gray any area that's going to get over an inch of rain. I stack them up with some transparency, which means the darker the shade, the higher the chances of picking up an additional inch of rain over the next 10 days. And we can see that is overall the broader case across much of North and South Carolina, feeding again on this moisture that's coming in like this. Here's a better way to look at it. On the left hand side, I have the European model showing us CAPE. That basically tells us how much moisture is in the atmosphere and how unstable it is. On the right hand side, I have the actual precipitation. Okay. So we play this one out. It's going to go real quickly here. Ready? This is now getting you into early Monday morning, getting us into Tuesday morning. Now you see at that point by Tuesday morning, we're watching the storms move through the eastern Corn Belt. Still a relatively dry day across much of North Carolina. When we get our best chance at precipitation, this is Tuesday afternoon. This is now Tuesday evening getting into the overnight hours. It's at this point that we destabilize the atmosphere and bring our best chance for showers and storms early in the week through parts of uh, North Carolina. So you see them sliding through right in through that time period. So Tuesday into Wednesday, okay? Now after this happens, watch what goes on. You can see that Wednesday night into Thursday morning, into Thursday afternoon and evening. We hang on to our risk for showers and storms, but they progress east as we move through the middle part of the week. By the time we get to Thursday afternoon, broader area of higher pressure moves in in both maps, you can see here, drying some things out, keeping our main thunderstorm threat on Thursday right along the coast, which is actually where we need it. Beyond this, let's now get into Friday. Drier air tries to move in, but we still keep the destabilized atmosphere, see it in through there, and our risk of storms Thursday night into Friday morning along the coast. Beyond this, look at this, this is Friday night getting you into your weekend, and we just keep seeing the stability stay well such that it's an unstable atmosphere and the moisture keeps pumping around this broader area of higher pressure. And so you just see, well, rounds of showers and storms as we progress into early next week. It's just your very typical hit or miss shower and thunderstorm activity as we take you all the way out to the next 10 days. This is very normal for us for August. Now, what is our temperatures doing? I told you, much above average throughout the next five days. Above average through days five through 10. This is when the deeper trough sweeps in through here, really bringing in some heat under that ridge. And even you taking out today 10 through 15, so this gets us all the way up to the 27th of August. We're gonna continue with the trend we've had for the last six months of keeping temperatures above average here for the Southeast. Okay, to let you know what's going on in the tropics, well, the answer to that is nothing. We're currently right now seeing very little activity uh, in the tropics. No major waves coming off of the west coast of Africa. We'll keep our eye on this, but very dry, dusty, vertically suppressed motion across the tropics. So the National Hurricane Center not watching much of anything over the next 10 days. Uh, of course, we know how quickly those things can change, though. So as we move over to our longer range forecast, I want you to see currently what's going on with our global temperature anomalies, specifically on the ocean surface. We've seen a collapse of El Nino. We've got cooler water emerged here, but still some warmer water over in the western part of the main El Nino region here. This has taken El Nino off as a major driver. We've seen a lot of warm water move into the North Pacific and some warm water here showing up where our ice is at near record level lows 
in parts of uh, the North Pacific, getting in the Arctic as well here, uh, just between Greenland and Hudson Bay. Meanwhile, water temperatures a little bit cooler than average off the West Coast, but very warm otherwise, meaning that if something could get into that area, we could uh, build up a tropical system very quickly. Now, why do I bring all these things up? Well, this is how they all kind of work together to give you our forecast moving forward. On the top, I have last month's forecast for August, September, and October. And on the bottom, I have the brand new forecast from the Long Range Euro for August, September, and October. And the main difference has been a, a cool down for the central United States. This is a slight cool down. This isn't calling for major like Arctic air blasts. This is just a couple of degrees below average. But while that goes on, the southeast, specifically the Carolinas, are continued to be forecast to stay above average as we progress through fall. So that's an important temperature forecast moving forward. It is no point me showing you a precipitation forecast at this point, given the uh, variability that we will be seeing as our tropical systems get going as we move toward the peak of hurricane season, which is one month away from today. But this is what temperatures look like for our next three months. Outside of this, I'm going to take in a quick global tour. I don't show you a map here of Europe, but I want you to know that parts of Western Europe are cooling off in the in the next 15 days, while parts of Ukraine, the Russian wheat belt, are actually going to go back over to a warmer pattern. In Asia, specifically, this, uh, the monsoon is going again pretty strongly here in parts uh, of India. And even though this area right in the here south of Beijing got a bunch of rain from the tropical system that just went through, they're showing up drier in the next 10 days as the remnants of this tropical system move here into the northern growing regions of China, north uh, of the Korean Peninsula. Meanwhile, another tropical system is moving here that will get absorbed into the jet stream flow. And the combination of that happening here is going to really upset our longer range forecasting over the next 10 to 20 days. We'll talk more about that next week. Finally, just to let you know something kind of funny here, it did snow in Australia. Australia, and it does snow where those kangaroos live here. Got a great video showing you quite a few of them here bounce around in the snow. I wonder if they're excited about this. It's like school kids get, but certainly this is a um, kind of a neat sight to see. All right, that was a lot, but we're going to go ahead and wrap it up right there. We at Nutrient Ag Solutions and at the Farm Credit System in North Carolina, thank you for your attention. Hope you look forward to our next update coming out next week. Thank you.